All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. That's, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, uh, tonight, we are going to talk about everybody's favorite topic, the supernatural powers, uh, otherwise known as the Siddhis. And there's Noe flying there. That's one of the Siddhis that we're going to talk about tonight is levitation, flight. We're going to talk about all of the fun stuff. Um, and as usual, we're going to talk about this a lot of different ways. Um, let me show everybody the whiteboard. We've got a few different words going on tonight. So let's start off with, so the, the word for tonight is going to be Siddhi, Siddhi, which kind of means an accomplishment, but we're going to talk about what that means. Uh, but basically, this is known as a supernormal power, supernatural or supernormal ability. But it, if, if you are able to do any of these things that we're going to talk about tonight, that is an accomplishment. You've, you've, you've gotten somewhere. So it's called a siddhi. Now, just to let you know, though, this word's like, let's say, let's say after we get into this, that you're interested in developing an accomplishment. If you are interested in developing these various siddhis, then you would need something called the, the Riddhi Padda. And that is, well, the root of the word Siddhi is Idhi. And in Pali, the word Riddhi is just Idhi. And so it's kind of the root of the word Siddhi, and that's Riddhi. And then Padda, you've heard the word Padda before, most famously the Dhamma Padda. Pada means step by step in a way. It can be translated as a path, but it kind of literally means step by step. So there is something called the Riddhi Pada, which is the step by step process for developing these powers. And then again, if you do this and you actually display one of these things, that's a Siddhi. And then just to let you know, we're going to talk sort of vaguely about the four. These, this is the step-by-step -step process, by the way. Chanda, virya, chitta, vimamsa. Desire, determination, chitta or mind. And then finally, experimentation. This would normally be translated as investigation. So we're going to talk a little bit about these, but first, let's back all the way up. So uh, regarding these supernatural abilities, something important to keep in mind is that, well, first of all, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. So we're going to be talking about the early form of Buddhism, that more ascetic, uh, forest dwelling, monastic, meditative type of Buddhism. So we're going to start there, but we're actually going to start even before that, because these things that we're going to be talking about tonight, the Siddhis, people in India have been talking about these for a long time, way before the Buddha. And so when the Buddha studied with all these forest dwelling ascetics and studied all of their different systems of meditation, many of them included the development of these superpowers. And so this, this tradition, if you want to call it that, this practice of the supernatural powers is a pre-Buddhist thing that the Buddha learns and that becomes part of Buddhism. But I also want you to know that as someone like myself, as someone who has studied, um, you know, my actually my area of expertise, if you didn't know, is actually Chinese religion, 
what you might call Taoism. F funny that I should wind up teaching so much Buddhism and basically be a, a Buddhist teacher, but my academic training was much more in Taoist studies and much more in Chinese religion. And wouldn't you know it, even before Buddhism gets to China, there is, of course, a kind of indigenous Taoist or Chinese system of meditation, what you might call yoga. And they too talked about the development of these, basically these same exact superpowers. And so that kind of leads me to sort of the first topic of conversation tonight. On the one hand, these, these things that we're going to talk about, and, oh, and be, well, instead of being so vague, I, I kind of joked at the beginning that levitation and flight, being able to fly, are a siddhi. But there are other siddhis as well. Um, in, there's kind of different lists of these. Some of them just have to do with miraculous powers, like levitation. A very kind of popular one is either being able to pass through solid objects as if they were water, or being able to stand on water as if it were land. Um, and then, of course, you get also, we're going to talk in more detail about these, but you get things like reading minds, telekinesis, moving objects at a distance, being able to divide the body and be two places at once. These are some of the siddhis. These are some of these uh, supernatural powers. And on the one hand, like I said, I want to kind of like put two ideas out here. On the one hand, in all these different meditation traditions, whether they be Indian or Chinese or otherwise, a lot of these traditions, when they talk about the development of these things, they describe them as what, what I call symptomatic of progress. What my point is, and this is especially true in the Buddhist tradition, where these things we're talking about tonight are not the goal, but the idea is, is that within the world of Buddhism, if these things start happening to you, they are signs that you are on the Riddhipada, they are signs that you are on that path of empowerment or that path of power, and in a way they are used as signposts or, or markers in, in, in that sense that you're moving in the kind of right direction in that sense. So again, these have always been part of the Buddhist tradition. And let me tell you, if you haven't heard this before, it's always helpful to know this, it'll help introduce the other thing I wanna talk about. So, in the world of Buddhist meditation, they don't talk about it as much as they used to actually. Like in the old Pali Canon, in those suttas, they would talk a lot about something very interesting. And what that was is that it, you would do meditation, you would do mindfulness meditation, get into a dhyana state, and in that dionic state, you could actually create what they call a mind-made body. So a kind of an imaginary body. And then they talk about actually transferring your consciousness out of this physical body and into that mind-made body. And it's in that mind made body that one is able to say, split their body into two and be two places at once. It's in that mind made body that you could do something like uh, what they call remote viewing, like seeing places at a distance in that way, vast distances. And so 
a lot of what we're going to talk about, because I, I do want to kind of walk you through some of these, some of the supernatural powers. But the idea here is, is that a lot of these, or all of them, actually, you, div you get them after this ability to create this mind-made body. And so this sort of forks a path. And I, I want to put this out there here tonight as a, you know, as a really genuine uh, topic to think about, like something to really, really think about, as, especially as we move forward. I guess I kind of, to put it simply, there's taking all of this very literally, like literally, like people flying, literally, people passing through solid objects, literally like defying the laws of physics. That's one way to think about all, all of this. There's going to be another way to think about all of this too. And I don't want this one to seem less than that other one. But another way to think about all of this is like, like what if I could what if I could get into such a state of mind that I kind of moved into basically a lucid dreaming state? <laughs> and in that lucid dreaming state, I had a very, very, very real experience of feeling as if I floated in the air. Now, from a certain mindset, from a certain mentality, one would say, ah, but you didn't really fly. You just imagined you were flying, right? And so that sort of is two ways to think about this, literally flying or imagining one is flying, but in such a, um, you know, it feels so real in that way. It might as well be a real levitation event or something like that. So take your pick. And there's, of course, plenty of room in between. There's plenty of room in between those two options. But I just kind of want to put that out there and sort of say that tonight, as we proceed, I'm not going to I'm not going to come down on one side or the other, but I will, let's see, how should we do this? Let, let me tell you a little bit more. Oh, yeah, no, questions are always the best way to do it. <laughs> it's uh, super early for a question, but hmm. <laughs> you get on the right track. Talked, uh, you talked about the mind made body. Is that a third way of thinking about this or is that? contained within one of the other ways either literally a mind created body that one's consciousness moves into or the creation of a mind made body is imagination okay, okay. so okay. there's always going to be the creation of a mind made body but it's a question of what does that mean okay so when you <laughs> say literally someone is flying it's literally their man mind made body that's flying. <laughs> this is gonna get this is definitely gonna get tricky. Um, yeah, this is and it's gonna get tricky because of all of that space in between those two options. So yeah. Or keep me on track, Gnome. Like if it hasn't, you know, if I haven't lived up to this promise of maintaining these two ideas. <laughs> Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about these different uh, superpowers in that way, and then we can kind of talk, think about it in that sense. So, um, I, like I said, or actually I didn't say, but in general, there are five siddhis in, in the Buddhist tradition. They talk about five. The first one is just power and or powers. And that's what they mean by levitation, path through solid objects, invisibility, um, kind of miraculous feats 
of the physical body in that sense. Those are all the, the powers in that way. The next is what is called the divine ear. And the divine ear is in, in English, we would actually call it clairaudience, <laughs> clear hearing, which is a lot like clairvoyance, if you know that term clear, clairvoyance, which means clear seeing. And I might as well mention it now, there is also the divine eye, which is basically clairvoyance. So you get the divine ear and the divine eye, clairaudience, clairvoyance. The divine ear is this ability to hear either things you shouldn't be able to hear, meaning like things going on in other rooms or things at a vast distance, and or the ability to hear what we would call ghosts, but to hear other dimensional beings. Let's just put it that way. Clairvoyance, clear seeing is very similar, but it is seeing other dimensional beings. It is seeing vast distances that are not, the human eye is not capable of seeing such vast distances. Um, that's sort of the main, just between of the divine ear, divine, divine eye, they have to do with sort of other dimensions or vast distances. A big one that I do want to talk about tonight um, at some point, a big one is, and it's a big one I say that because in the Buddhist path, when this one starts happening, when this siddhi starts to appear, you, you really know you're getting somewhere. And that one is the ability to see past lives, to see your past incarnations that led to you being here now. And then the last of these is, mm, it can kind of range. It's a general uh, ability of what would be called telepathy, the ability to read people's minds. It can range from just sort of reading their, their present thoughts. It could be reading their minds in, in ways that they're not even thinking about, like being able to read deeper into their minds in that way. And there's also sort of wrapped up into this, a kind of a sense, definitely within the Buddhist world, it's a sense that from, from knowing others' minds, you also have a deep sense of their karmic trajectory. And so it's not that you can see the future, but you can kind of see the really, the major arc that the karma is leading them towards in that way. And in general, by the way, if you didn't know this, just a little aside, just a little bracket, Within the world of Buddhism, the future is very, like, karmically, the trajectories are in motion. They're not locked in. It's not totally deterministically fated to happen a certain way, but there's pretty big trends that are kind of obvious to someone with the siddhi of this um, telepathy, for lack of a better term. So. Those are the general siddhis, which again, the first one is a whole, a whole bevy of, of uh, superpowers in that way. So you get a lot of these. Now, one of the things to deal with is the fact, again, that people have been talking about these all over different countries, different cultures for a very, very long time. And that only, always sort of raises a... a the question of like, what are, what were they talking about? Were they talking about literally people flying or were they talking about people literally having the experience that they were flying? And what I mean by that is, is that there are of course, um, 
eyewitness accounts of people performing the Siddhis. And the fact that there are eyewitness accounts of people witnessing others perform these miracles, perform these feats, it kind of, it makes it a little problematic to just think it's imaginary. To just think it's imaginary. It's kind of, as soon as we have eyewitness accounts, it starts to sound like literally people are flying, literally people are levitating, passing through solid objects. Again, my, my whole thing here tonight is to not come down as the skeptic. I don't want to come down as the blind faith believer in that way. So I just really want to make this really broad tonight, like comfortable for everybody in that sense. So Everybody doing okay so far? I was just, I was just gonna make a comment about uh, these. There's always like you know magicians can create air and witness us into believing that they are flying or sorry, can you hear me? Uh, barely. <laughs> okay, so I uh, thank you. Okay, yeah, you can hear me now, right? Yep. Okay, so I no, I was just saying that. With witness accounts, uh, there's always uh, magicians can do this type of things as well and <laughs> trick the public. So it's just because the books are very old, it's <clears throat> difficult to, to know what, eh, how, like, I mean, where was the line between magic and uh, reality? <clears throat> very, very good point. It's uh, one of the reasons why I'm leaving this very open tonight for such. Uh, voices of reason to say, ah, but even firsthand, you know, eyewitness accounts may or may not be, you know, believable in that sense. So totally good point with the magician, actually great point about the magician in terms of where I'm hoping to lead tonight's talk. So, yeah, so we have this sort of, um, you know, what do we do with uh, eyewitness accounts. What we what do we do with personal accounts? So you know, there's a lot of people who claim to have clairvoyance. You know, fortune tellers of all sorts, of all cultures, also divine ear type stuff. People hearing ghosts and all of that. So you know, human culture is proliferated with all of these ideas. And, you know, not, I, and I certainly don't wanna to digress to just a, a conversation about the supernatural or the supernormal, because I do wanna bring this back to, well, the Riddhi Padda. So I wanna bring this back to this actual um, process that they talk about to develop, the, to develop these things. So, Really quickly, and I, I'm doing all of this actually just for one or two little reasons, but so let me remind you of the Riddhipada. These are the four steps, the step-by-step -step process to development of the Riddhi, of power in that sense. So <clears throat> the first one, Chanda. This is a really important one to, to start with. It's actually these four steps by the way, are progressive, meaning it does begin with chanda, then virya, then chitta, and then vimamsa. So let me tell you about those. Um, yeah, actually, let me grab this, tell you. <clears throat> if you are familiar with the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha, there's an entire section in here that I'm not going to dig around to find just right now, but there's a whole section in here that's on the Riddhipada. It's the Riddhipada section. So everything I'm about to tell you, and I'm going to even quote from a few suttas, they're coming from here. And so there's a few different suttas in that section that describe this Riddhipada. And I got to tell you that, you know, I've been curious about the Riddhipada for a while, and it definitely seems to be this sort of um, 
like, how can I put it? If the eightfold path, like, you know, the noble eightfold path, that is, that's, you know, the Buddha calls that the ekya yana, the single vehicle to enlightenment. So the eightfold path is the path, but kind of running concurrently over here on the side is this little Ritipada. And it's all kind of running concurrently on the side because this is the way you develop the supernatural powers. If you want to end your suffering, you want to become enlightened, all of that, follow the noble eightfold path. But if you want to <laughs> have some supernatural powers, do the Riddhi Padda. Yeah, Tanya. But the Riddhi, Riddhi Padda, it's not like when you're talking about desire, it's not desire. Is it desire for enlightenment? It's not desire for to become, to have the Siddhis, right? Great question. Excellent, excellent question. So Tanya caught it right away. So Tanya caught that, oh, the first, the first step of the Riddhipata is desire. But isn't desire like the bad thing that we're, as Buddhists, we're supposed to be avoiding? That's the first reason why I wanted to do a little Dharma talk on this tonight. One of the things that I think is so important for uh, Buddhists, for practitioners, Buddhist practitioners to know is that chanda, desire, not tanha, not we're not talking about craving, wanting. We're not talking about craving and wanting. Chanda is a desire. And the thing that the, the Buddha basically, it's one of the hindrances, it's one of the nivarana, one of the obstructions of the mind, is kama chanda. So kama, K-A-M-M-A, is, the, the, is uh, pleasures of the senses. You probably know it from the Kama Sutra, that it's you know, very linked to sexual pleasure, so kama chanda is the desire for kama, the desire to eat good things, see beautiful things, hear beautiful music, make, you know, have sex with the body, all the sensual pleasures. That's kama chanda. However, what you find out if you read that section of the Samyutta Nikaya, if you read the suttas about the Riddhipada, there's this really great sutta. It's a conversation with a Brahmin. And I forget the name of the Brahmin, but that's the name of the sutra is the name of this Brahmin. And this Brahmin actually goes to Ananda. And he, the Brahmin comes to this garden where Ananda is to ask him some questions. And Ananda is actually teaching the Brahmin about the Riddhipada. And the Brahmin has the same thought that Tanya has, the same thought that I had. The Brahmin asks Ananda, but wait, I thought Chanda, I thought desire was bad. How can you use Chanda to get rid of Chanda? It's what the Brahmin asks. How could you use desire to overcome desire? And Ananda says something very interesting, and it's very illuminating, actually, about the nature of desire. And what he says is, is he says, Brahman, this morning, when you thought that you were going to come to the garden to ask me questions, didn't you want to come to the garden to ask me questions? And the Brahman says, well, yeah. And Ananda says, and now that you're in the garden asking me these questions, do you still want to come to the garden? And the Brahmin says, well, no, because I have arrived. I'm in the garden. So I don't have the desire to come to the garden anymore. And Ananda says, it's just like that. 
to to become enlightened, to end suffering, to attain the cities in that sense. One needs to want to do that. And in fact, what Ananda says is, is that you will never end suffering, you will never reach enlightenment if you don't want to. But what he says is, is that once we are enlightened, we don't want to become enlightened anymore. So it's a really subtle teaching about chanda, and it's a teaching about how it depends about it depends on what you want. So chanda isn't the problem. It's what the wanting is about. Yeah, Tanya. Thanks for, for that. But in this case, for the desire, is it the desire for the cities or is it desire for enlightenment? Because um, yep. cause, cause like, <laughs> it's, like a, it's supposed to be like a side product, right? Like Yes. So... I have to tell you that it would seem, it would seem as if the Riddhipada, the desire that they're talking about, it does seem like it is to obtain the Siddhis. But you need to know that, that they're sort of, how can I put this? Very important point. I always make this point, but I got to make it tonight. Within the world of Buddhism, I often point out that there are these four, if you're a monastic, that is, there are only four things that get you kicked out for life. Killing, stealing, having sex, because you've taken a vow not to do that, by the way, remember there's monastics. So killing, stealing, having sex, and claiming to have the siddhis. Now, what the prohibition is against is bragging and claiming that you can do this. It is not about not developing them. And so the reason why it's, I mentioned that, Tanya, is because at a certain level, so your question is spot on, by the way. Do, are they... Is the Riddhipada to end suffering and get enlightened in that way, or is it to develop supernatural powers? And there's kind of a way in which those two things are synonymous. They're, they, are, they are kind of the same thing in that way. And the way that I kind of want to continue talking about them is in that way, where they're where the Riddhipada is for the development of supernatural powers, which is really just to say <laughs> ending suffering. And in fact, by the way, I should mention this too, that the, the Buddhists, they tack on a sixth Siddhi, a sixth accomplishment to the list of the normal five. And the sixth one that the Buddhists talk about that other traditions in India don't talk about as a superpower, the sixth one in Buddha, in Buddhism, is knowing the end of suffering. <laughs> and it's the greatest superpower of, of all in that way. So again, that's where the development of Siddhis and the goal in that sense are synonymous. Oh, yeah, Noe, or, yep. Uh, yeah, it's Sophie. Oh, there you go. Sorry, Sophie, please. Yeah, so my question is uh, a little bit of uh, context. So mm -hmm. is this, what part of uh, Buddhism is this, what you're describing? Is it like a different schools, like general Buddhism or, yeah, I mean, because I, yep. I have never heard about this and I am a bit uh, just lost in the space of uh, context so let's talk about context that'll be really important for where i plan to take us this evening so the basics of what i'm describing again are very very much a part of the early form of buddhism what is sometimes called the hinayana or the remaining theravada school we're talking about the Southeast Asian form of Buddhism in 
Sri Lanka, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Southeast Asia. And the thing about it is, is that I know that anyone sort of that's been exposed to uh, Theravada or even kind of just Buddhism, American Buddhism, if you've been exposed to it through mindfulness and the sort of the Theravada adjacent lay form of mindfulness that's in America, they don't talk a lot about the superpowers, but it's a really helpful thing to know that in the late 1800s, when you had a bunch of these characters, characters like Alistair Crowley, Madame Lavatsky, a lot of the early Theosophical Society people, if you've heard of those, these kind of French and British and American transcendentalists that were really into the occult and esoteric things. Well, these people were the, some of the first Westerners to go to Southeast Asia to study Buddhism, to study with the Theravadins and actually uh, Madame Lavatsky and a few other of the Theosophical Society people were the first Westerners ordained into the Theravada, lay Theravada tradition. And the reason why these magic, you know, Aleister Crowley is like a magician in Europe and all of that. The reason why they wanted to go down to Southeast Asia to study Buddhism is to learn this. They wanted to learn to levitate. They wanted to learn to pass through solid objects. And they knew that that's what the Buddhists were sort of able to teach. Now, the reason why you might not have heard about it, Sophie, and the reason why it's not really talked about, it's kind of because of that fourth rule that I mentioned, that this is not an advertised aspect of Buddhism, but it is a part of Buddhism once you get involved in it. And I want to clarify that so far, I've only been talking about that early uh, Theravada tradition or the Hinayana in that way. However, this part of Buddhism, the magical part, for lack of a better term, this actually has a whole huge history. And what I mean is, is that, so if we take a date for the Buddha as being the classic 500 BC, the Buddha taught what I'm describing. He talks actually a lot about what I'm describing, like the creation of a mind-made body and the ability to travel around, like basically psychically project. The Buddha talked a lot about it or what sounds like psychic projection, but he again, described it his own way. If you take 500 BC as the date of the Buddha, this aspect of Buddhism stays a part of Buddhism and it becomes a part of what is called the Mahayana tradition, which is actually what I'm going to talk about tonight. But before that, if you move ahead in time to about 500 AD, so a thousand years after the lifetime of the Buddha, but still quite a long time ago from where we are, in 500, and again, these are not exact dates, of course, but in that general time frame of around 500 AD, in India, not just in Buddhism, but all over India, there was the rise of a, well, I guess you could call it a movement, a religious movement, a social movement. And the basis of that movement were these practitioners who were called not just siddhas, maha siddhas. And a siddha is someone who has siddhis. <laughs> so a siddha has developed siddhis. And they're 
started, oh, and by the way, everything, everything I'm telling you about, if you're interested in this, this is like the best book on this topic, uh, Indian Esoteric Buddhism, a social history of the tantric movement. So what he does in this great piece of scholarship is he traces the origins of Buddhist Tantra, the Vajrayana tradition, and he traces it back to this Mahasiddha, um, like a, it was like a craze. It was a, it was a movement where all of a sudden everybody got really, really excited about these people who were displaying supernatural powers or who were teaching them, like getting, you know, saying, hey, I'll teach you supernatural powers and people were following them. And so these Mahasiddhas, of which many were Buddhist monks, because the Buddhists in India were always considered to be the most potent magicians. I, the, that term's obviously a tricky term, magician, but so many of the Mahasiddhas were Buddhist monks. And what starts to happen is, is that these miracle workers, these uh, uh, thermotages, or these uh, wonder workers, they be start to get these kind of cult followings where they become, mm, you know, not as important as the Buddha, but they take on a kind of, you know, divine status in that way. And that tradition, if you read this book, will, you will find out that that's sort of the origin of the Nepalese and Tibetan Vajrayana tradition. And it all goes back to people displaying these supernatural powers. And then as many of you know, um, ma many of you know that my history, as I mentioned at the opening was in Chinese religion. And I was actually really interested in medieval Chinese Buddhist Taoist magic. That's what I was doing my PhD uh, dissertation on. And so I was very interested in how the magical aspects of Buddhism in and around the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth centuries, how those magical aspects of Buddhism became totally like, like why would you even bother getting involved in Buddhism in China in the fifth, sixth century? for the magic. So you were either joining to develop magical powers in that way, or you were seeking out a Buddhist monk or a nun. There were many kind of shamanist nuns as well, but you were seeking out a Buddhist monk or a nun to do some magic for you. So there became this whole like subculture of Buddhist wonder workers. And they had a whole uh, interesting slew of, of techniques, one of which I'll tell you about. I could be here all night telling you about interesting things, but one thing that became very popular in China was that Buddhist monks would use their begging bowl and they would fill the begging bowl with water. And then they would have the person who wanted this done they would have the person look into the, the water and then the monastic monk or nun would look at the person's face in the surface of the water and would be able to read their karma, be able to read their kind of read their mind, read their karma and be able to tell about their future. And they were kind of uh, fortune tellers in that way. And a lot of Chinese Buddhist monastics were able to survive, meaning the way that they begged for, for survival, they were able to do it because they provided services like this kind of fortune telling. I did also, many of you might know, because I say this often, my work, my academic work, I was translating these Chinese magic books they were like Buddhist Taoist magic books. And I was kind of like just curious about what people were going to these monks for. 
Like what, what did they want it? What did they want from them? And then you find out that, wow, these Buddhist monks, they were putting uh, hexes and curses on people. Um, one of the big, uh, big, big ones that actually is basically kind of still around today, a really big function of Buddhist uh, wonder-working monastics was making it rain. So this is like a piece of history that, you know, somebody needs to write a really great book about this because we often, I know that I, in my popular imagination, always sort of associate the rain dance and like rain making rituals with Native Americans. Maybe that was just from my, my education, what I was taught, but the whole world <laughs> everywhere has had magical processes for getting it to rain. Again, th this is like all over the world. In fact, you know, even the Brahmanic, the Vedic tradition, a lot of the Brahmins, a lot of what they do in terms of chanting the Vedas and then creating a sacred fire and doing kind of a form of magic, one of the main things they're involved in is uh, meteorological maintenance, for lack of a better term. Like that's what they're up for, is, is either making it rain or making it stop raining. No. <laughs> so that was a very long answer to Sophie's question about where, where is this in Buddhism? It's everywhere in Buddhism. It's in the early meditation tradition. It's in the diasporic uh, forms of Buddhism that went abroad and why they, why they were welcomed was because eh, ending suffering sounds good, but a good rainstorm sounds better for a lot of people was the idea. And so the importation of Buddhism into China had a lot to do with the magical side of these things. And then if you fast forward, by the way, to the year 1000, so now we're 1500 years after the lifetime of the Buddha, around the year 1000 in China, Korea, Japan, definitely, and Mongolia, the role of Buddhist monastics was to chant sutras in order to create a karmic force field around the nation to protect it from invasion. That was one of the number one roles of, of monastics during the kind of late medieval period, again, around the year 1000. So again, that's sort of a probably too long of an answer to Sophie's inquiry about where this fits into Buddhism, but. Oh, this, was, this was great. Um... Oh, sorry. This was yep. great. And if I may, I'm going to ask the last question in between your talk. Please. Um, basically, again, probably my poor understanding of Buddhism is, has been so far that uh, to let go of my sense, sense of agency or sense of control. And hmm. all this seems like there is increasing your controlling abilities in the, in the environment. Not just on, on, your, on yourself, or on, on on life and events themselves. Excellent, great comment. Um, a great comment because it's exactly sort of where I wanted to take the talk. I kind of wanted to move away from making it rain more towards sort of the Dharma in that sense. So Sophie makes a really good point about all of this that it sounds a little, well you know, at least from a Buddhist point of view, a little too active in that way, a little too, you know, trying to, trying to do something in that sense. So let's back up and, oh, and, and you know, well, I, I won't, I won't digress, but I could say a lot more about all of that magic stuff and about, you know, whether we should even be calling that Buddhism, but let's just leave that aside. Robert? Word. On mute. No, I'll be really quick. And that really? is, I am pretty sure that Nostradamus would look into a 
bowl of inky water to prognosticate. So when you and I, I had put that in my my gray matter a long time ago, <laughs> and then you just said that the 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 magic nuns and monks would do kind of the same thing. Sure. Yeah. Again, Robert, I would love to be here all night talking about that type of thing, where it's like, oh, they do that because over here they do that too. Like, there's so many things we could do that with. But let's back up. I want to talk. I want to kind of finish talking about the the Ridipada a little bit, and I just kind of wanted to point out. And again, this is going to kind of address Sophie's inquiry or her comment. So. Let's put it to you this way. So let's make this easy. And what I mean is, is let's go back to where the development of these supernatural powers and ending suffering and enlightenment, like let's go back to where these are synonymous, where we're still, it's still the goal of Buddhism to alleviate suffering. Let's do that. And let's, look at the Riddhipada, those four steps, as a kind of, um, well, what are, they, what are they talking about? In this case, I think a really helpful analogy, it's going to sound like I'm trying to make it more than an analogy, but really, I just want to use this as an analogy. But let's take something like uh, lucid dreaming and we could even kind of roll it into like like uh dream yoga like doing dream yoga but a certain sort of like it, it, inducing lucid dreams in order to become conscious during a dream and let's say that i you know let's say you were interested in doing that and let's say i told you about a simple technique in order to induce lucid dreams, right? I've mentioned this many times in the past, a very classic simple technique to induce lucid dreaming is to start making it a regular routine of stopping and asking yourself, why isn't this a dream? And normally it is very easy in terms of just a just a sense of embodiment, a sense of continuity, really quickly, you will be able to deduce, oh yeah, this is life. <laughs> this is not a dream. And if you get into the habit of doing that, meaning that you do it a couple times a day, ideally like once an hour during your, the waking state, sooner than later, and usually sooner, you will be in a dream, and you will do your periodic reality check. But that time you will be like, whoa, this is a dream. But you will need to have done that stop and ask yourself, is, is this a dream? You'll need, to be, you'll need to do that. You'll need to remember to do that, right? So that's a quick little how to induce a lucid dream. And I just told you about it. Let's walk through the four riddhipada, the four steps of the riddhipada, and notice how it lines up with the development of a lucid dream. So the first thing is you have to want to have a lucid dream. <laughs> if you don't care at all about having a lucid dream, it, it's probably not going to happen. And it might happen accidentally in that way. But if you want to have a lucid dream, you need to want to have a lucid dream. So that's the first step on the Riddhipada. You want to end suffering? You've got to want to end your suffering. That has to actually be of, of interest to you. Number two, what's the second step? Virya, right? Where we get the English word vigor from determination, drive. So in my example, when I said, oh, well, you want, oh, you want, you, ch you chanda, you want a lucid dream? Well, if you put forth the effort 
and once an hour, stop and check your reality, if you put forth the effort to do that, it is a technique that will induce a lucid dream. Now, if you want to have a lucid dream, and I told you that you could, that that's a technique, and you were like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But you don't do it. <laughs> you, you don't actually stop once an hour and ask yourself if it's dream. That's not virya. That's not the effort. That's not the drive. So virya is doing the hourly reality check, right? And that leads us to the third of the Riddhipada, which is... Uh, one question. Oh, yeah, Renata. Is, um, what if you've always been a lucid dreamer and you can't understand not being so? Um, in my analogy, that would be being a Buddha and not understanding what it's like to not be a Buddha. Um, so that my analogy will not pertain to anyone who is perpetually locked into the lucid dream state. Sorry, Renata, but that's, that's the honest answer. <laughs> um, but that being the case, though, Renata, still pay attention to, to what we're talking about in that way. So the third of the, of the Riddhipada is the chitta, the mind state. And chitta, by the way, is kind of basically this catch-all phrase in, this, in the Riddhipada. It's sort of a catch-all phrase for meditation, like a meditative state of mind. So when they talk about chitta, they're sort of talking about developing that calm, meditative state of mind. In my analogy, though, chitta is, um, I mean, you could say it's being lucid, but I would also say that it's also dreaming, too. Like, the chitta is that state of mind that it might be lucid, or it might be dreaming, meaning it, it's deluded into thinking that that's reality. But the chitta is that mind state. And so the idea here is, is that we've got the desire, we put forth the effort, and so we begin to cultivate that state of mind, which means the lucid state of mind. And so what I'm getting at is, is that the virya would be your effort doing the periodic check, and then in the dream state, you're going to bed planning, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to remember to do my reality check. And then in the dream, to the best of your ability, you are trying to generate that question, is this reality or not? And so all of that is the working on the chitta. And then the fourth of the Riddhipada is this word, show it to you again, vimamsa. And vimamsa is, if you've ever heard, I know I'm going to put out a lot of dharmas here tonight. There's also this other list called the seven factors of awakening. These are the seven aspects of, that lead to bodhi, that lead to awakening. One of the seven things that lead to awakening is what's called dharma vichaya, investigation of dharmas, investigation of phenomena. Vimamsa is very related to vichara. It's very related to this idea of experimentation, investigation, curiosity in that way. And so the fourth aspect of bringing about, well, in this elusive state, is experimentation. Experimenting with lucid dreaming. So now my point is, is this, let's say you wanted to have a lucid dream. Let's say you put forth the effort and let's say you cultivated that state of mind and you had a lucid dream. It worked. Like you did the practice, you were committed to the practice. And then in the dream, you asked yourself, 
Why am I, why is this, into, why isn't this a dream? Oh, this is a dream. So you had your first lucid experience and then you woke, woke up because that happens a lot to people who first have their first lucid experience. It gets so exciting, you wake up. Do it again tomorrow night. So Vimamsa is the idea of experimentation investigation it's because it's not going to just happen once i mean it's not going to stick just upon that initial breakthrough you're going to have to keep experimenting the idea is is now if you put all four of those steps into process and keep at it because they don't call it practice for nothing so if you keep at the practice the idea is is that you will eventually become a skilled lucid dreamer. Or if we go back to what we're actually talking about, you desire for the development of supernatural powers, you put forth the effort to do so by cultivating dhyana and samadhi, cultivating meditative mind states, and eventually you're gonna display a siddhi, eventually something, you know, I don't know what kind of city it'll be, but you're going to have a symptom, a display of that accomplishment. And that'll be a sign. You're doing it the right way. And now you want to begin the experimentation process. And Tanya, to go back to your original question of desire for supernatural powers or desire for awakening, the mamsa sort of makes it sound like it's <clears throat> about developing the supernatural powers and then experimenting with them. So I will put that out there that the Riddhipada is focused on developing these and then cultivating them. So, all right, everybody. Oh yeah, Tanya. I don't know if you're gonna talk about this, but like where this sort of stands today in current Buddhism. Mean. Yeah. Um, where does it stand today? Um, you, if you go to if you go to Taiwan or you go to Japan, you go to mainland China, or go to Tibet, go to Dharmasala in India, you go to a Buddhist community, and the thing about it is. So it's, I, what I want, what I'm kind of getting at is, is that, for example, in the Tibetan Vajrayana path, which is very, very popular nowadays, many, many people practice it both in India, meaning the, the, the Tibetan community in India, but also outside of that. And then, of course, in American Vajrayana communities, like I was saying, Vajrayana is a holdover of that old Siddhi Mahasiddha movement. And so there's a lot of things, for example, like mantras. Mantras, mantras are, are for magic. Mantras are for making things happen. The idea that a mantra is to like calm your mind down and like just be like a recitation for meditation. Mm, uh, that seems like a very, very 20th, <laughs> a 20th century like way of thinking about mantras. Whereas all my studies of mantras, it's all about the, this stuff, all about, they were basically magic spells. The Chinese, for the entire history of Chinese Buddhism, a mantra, they translated it as a magic spell. It was, it was not an aid for meditation. It was to affect, to affect change in the world. So doing like uh, the rain rituals I was talking about, like getting it to rain, you're going to have to recite a lot of mantras to get it to rain. I say this because. If you know about, like, for example, I knew all about this. I had already done all of my 
um, doctoral research and all of that before I went to Taiwan for the first time to live in a monastery and to do uh, uh, serious meditation practice. And knowing all of this, I could see in the monastery, I could see in the liturgy, all of these remnants of the super magical stuff that I'm talking about. For them, it wasn't magical anymore. They were like any of the mantras that were actually about making magic, they were reciting them as part of a liturgy, as part of a daily practice. Um, you, you might be familiar with like the Tibetan prayer flags. That's all super magical stuff. That's all creating like karmic force fields around temples to keep uh, evil spirits out and all of that. So it's interesting because you know, and I basically, I think a lot of this died out, died out with, you know, the kind of post-Renaissance rise of the, the Enlightenment era and the rise of science. Science, you know, killed magic across the earth in that way, or at least the new form of magic called science <laughs> replaced all of the other forms of magic. Um, so it's not that Buddhists became more rational. I think it's that the world became, quote, more rational. And so a lot of this sort of just, uh, it, again, it doesn't disappear. It's just sort of layered over in that way. So, yeah, Noe. Well, hey there, Michael, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, and, and who will know this? Uh, you know, who would know this? The guy go, you know, the Buddha. There's a story about the the, the monk and the, the the bow up on top of the the flagpole, and, and the rich man said, "Oh, so it's a beautiful bow." And the monk came along and floated up there and grabbed the bow and circled it around. And everybody's like, "Ooh, ah," you know. And when he got back, the Buddha says, "You know, he was admonished for doing that." He says, "You don't show this." This is not necessary to show this. You won't do it. It's a form of and he's rebuked more or less for, for showing off. If you have a magical power, would this is the, the powers are there, I or or not. Do you cultivate them? If you cultivate them, why would you tell anybody? Mm -hmm. I mean, right? I mean, I I <clears throat> actively lucid dream, but it's only to my benefit and to you know, of course, now that I have a direction, uh, matter to others. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but it's constant and it's, it doesn't get me anything. <laughs> won't, won't give me a ticket to the movies, but you know, um, I, I digress. So it is for it is a, a study for not not self in the sense of selfishness, but in the sense of of, of broadening myself. To, to examine these powers. Yeah, Noe, and your comment slash kind of question relates to something Sophie said earlier that I did want to get back to. And so they very related. Um, yeah, so I want to get back to like, so we've, this has been a very tricky talk. This has been a very tricky one tonight because like I'm doing the thing that I often do where on the one hand, like I'm trying to just be a Dharma teacher and talk about meditation and Dharma and like the basics, but then I'm kind of this academic historian that knows all this other stuff. And so I can tell you like over here, they're telling you, you shouldn't tell anybody that you have these. Oh, and by the way, over here, they're telling everybody that they have these. And so it gets tricky being a teacher in that way of like, I, I feel like I'm telling you two different stories when the sad reality is that history is like, or the, what they call the precept and the practice. What people are supposed to do and what they do are rarely the same. So let me get back to the more Dharma based one. But I do wanna bring into this by the way, because it sounds like everybody, or sounds like a few of you 
have deep lucid dreaming experiences or are deep into that practice. So let's kind of segue to an, another way to think about this. So one way to think about this is So I often, many of you know, and but since Sophie it might, is new and a few other new people here might not have heard me say it. So the reason why I do talk a lot about lucid dreaming and use the dreamscape or dream states as an, as an analogy, the reason why I focus a lot on dreams is because the way that I understand Bodhi, so this idea of awakening, well, you know, they call it enlightenment, but the term is actually awakening. And the way that I understand awakening, Bodhi, well, the way that I understand it is this, let's look at a dream. For many people, most people, when you fall asleep and then you are all of a sudden in a dream, well, one of, one of the things is you think it's just normal reality. You just think it's a normal day in your life. And so you think you're you and all of the things that you're seeing are there to be seen. And if you wanted it, you could go get it. And if, you know, you, it's a subject-object relationship in the dream. Now, the thing about that is, is that when I'm in a dream and I feel embodied, I could be afraid, meaning I could have a nightmare because I could think somebody is coming to get my body, meaning they're coming to get me, but because I feel embodied, and remember, I think this is real. I think this is real. So. Now I can be afraid because this thing's coming to get me. But also, because I feel embodied, if, if I were to, like, what could, you know, I don't know what it could be, but if there were some object in that dream, and let's say it's an object or a, better yet, a big envelope of money. Let's say I had a dream in which I saw a big envelope of money, but I thought it was reality. I thought it was a normal day in my life, right? I would get so excited if I like just, I had a dream that walking down the street, I found a big envelope of money. I would get excited because I would start going, well, I could pay my rent. I could do this. I could do that. This is going to be great. So I get excited or I get fearful because of this dream stuff. But remember, I'm deluded. I'm ignorant. I'm confused. I think this is reality, which is why I'm afraid of it and why I'm so excited by it. Let's say I did my reality check. Like right before I went to grab the money or right before the person got me, I did the reality check and I was like, wait a minute, maybe I'm dreaming. Oh, I am dreaming. So here's the thing. And now I know that there's a, a number of uh, veteran lucid dreamers in the room. So my experience, my experience of a lucid dream like that, let's say either where somebody was coming to get me or there was the big envelope of money. My experience of a lucid dream, when I become lucid in a dream, everything is exactly like it was right before I became lucid. The only thing that, well, the major thing that's different, of course, is that I am now aware that I am dreaming. But the most important thing that happens from that lucid awareness is that I know I have no reason to be afraid, but I also have no reason to get excited. That money is useless 
It's dream money. I can't use it. So now all of a sudden, my disposition, my disposition towards that money is it's no longer interesting to me. It, it's as if it were empty. It's as if it were not real. In fact, it is not real. So all of a sudden, I'm not excited by this big envelope of money anymore. Likewise, though, I'm not afraid of the creature that's coming to get me, or if the car flies off the cliff. I'm not afraid because I know I'm not in a body. Like, I know that I don't need to be afraid. Even though the, the, even though the experience is still being in the car flying off the cliff. So my point is, is that when one becomes lucid in a dream, for me, it's about the em emotional disposition entirely changing, where I'm not afraid, but also not desirous in that way. For me, Bodhi, awakening, I believe, and in, it's what I practice, it's my experience. My understanding of Buddhism and why they talk about awakening is that there is a way to wake up here and be lucidly living. It's like a lucid dream, but it's in this reality where you wake up. And you know what's going to happen when that happens? It's going to look exactly the same. But your emotional disposition towards it is going to be entirely different. You will not be afraid, but you will also not be so excited about all of this ephemeral sensory data. Just like in a dream. And so the idea is, is that especially when we're in this uh, Mahayana Buddhist tradition that we're talking about, where they're talking about all conditioned phenomena being empty, they're talking, and this is, aren't my words now, these are the Buddha's words, that all conditional phenomena are like dream objects. All conditional phenomena are like illusions. There are they are just like dream things, but they are dream things that we're confused about. And so we get afraid of them or we get very, very, very excited about them. And so equanimity, upeksha, is about that same, if you can imagine, and many of you are lucid dreamers, so do it, imagine it. That same waking up realization about this reality that same clarity, the clarity that you have in a lucid dream where you know that you know the nature of that reality. Isn't that what that means to be a lucid dreamer? Is that you are aware of the dream nature of what you're experiencing. Even though you, even though again, for me, it still looks the same. I'm still looking at things and still feeling as if I'm embodied, but I know it's a dream. And by virtue of knowing, again, I'm not afraid and I'm not desirous. So if Bodhi awakening is like that, then again, the idea is the same. It's all going to look just like this, but what's going to be different is your emotional relationship to it just like in a dream. All right, everybody doing good with all of that? Because I, I have way more to say, by the way. Cool, so, oh. One thing, I, no. I think that, he's on, yeah. But yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think that all makes sense for anything that is, um, let's say emotional, or like in your expectations about life, but for things that are, uh, let's say physical I, I think there's a difference if I wake up in the middle of a lucid dream and I find a lot of money I'm like oh I don't need to eat to maintain myself in the dream or to pay my bills for real 
but uh, here in the real world, I do need to eat the same way that if I would be dreaming about, you know, hitting myself against the wall, I, I don't know, I might not experience pain the same way or I have to make it stop, especially if I'm like lucid dreaming. But if I now just run towards the wall and I like hit my head, it, it will hurt. So there is, there are different implications from like waking up in a lucid dream or waking up in the real world. Absolutely, absolutely, Sophie, absolutely. I would still though suggest looking at, I, I hear you. And the idea here is, is that while, while the, the Buddha and Buddhism will talk about the dream-like nature of this reality, we need and must understand the, the, uh, the rules, let's call it the rules of this dream reality. And by the rules of this dream reality, I'm actually referring to what the Buddhists call pratitya samutpatta, dependent origination. The rules of this dream reality are about dependent co-origination. And what that means is, yeah, you run your head into the wall, you're going to get a bump. It's going to hurt. That's part of the cause and condition or part of the dependent origination of this reality. Now, the thing about it, though, is, is this. So let's say, again, I want to point to the emotionality of it because it's the one thing, you know, it's the one thing actually, and I don't say this enough. I, I, I said it to somebody recently and they were like, well, that's really smart or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I guess I should remind people of that. In the, in the Buddhist tradition, because of this dependent origination thing that's going on and all of that, there's a way in which you know, there's, a, in fact, a, there's a lot of debates, a lot of books that are written about the idea of free will, and, or, you know, do we have free will in Buddhism, or if there's no self, and there's just karma, is there free will, there's a lot of conversation about that idea. And what I kind of really like to point out is that what Buddhism is actually, or what I think Buddhism is very interested in, is that while we really can't control our, the, our environment to that degree. What we have 100% control over is the way that we react to things. That's what we can change. <laughs> So my point is, is that, you know, things will happen. Things are going to happen. And in a way, you know, you think about even things like illness in a way. You take something like, um, you know, everybody's been there. I've been there. You feel something, you, you see something, and fear sets in deep. You get very, very, I, it has happened to me, getting very, 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 very afraid of dying for seeing something on my body or feeling something in my body. Now, the thing about it is, is that something might develop in my body, it might happen. The way that I react to that that's what I have control over, or I don't have control over. That's the practice. Do you have control over your emotional responses or don't you have control over your emotional responses? Ultimately, Buddhism is saying is that we can have total sovereignty, total control over our emotional reactions to things. The things that happen though, we have limited control over the things that happen in that way. And so, again, my point, going back to the idea of, of you know, having an a internal ailment, let's say. Again, 
I've had plenty. So I've had plenty of those experiences. And of course, I'm still here, thankfully, and I have no fatal illnesses that I know of, thankfully. So you know what I learned from those past experiences? My freak out was unwarranted and didn't help. That's what I learned from those experiences. It was unwarranted because actually what I was, the, 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 um, the crazy, terrible things I imagined were not. But I imagined them and I freaked myself out and I freaked myself out because of fear of mortality in that way. So again, Sophie, I'm trying to be very careful here in terms of, you know, I don't want anybody jumping off any cliffs thinking, oh, Michael said it's just a dream or anything like that. No, 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 no. It's not about that. Well, again, the reason why I like to use the lucid dream analogy is that idea of, um, or even going back, in my lucid dream analogy, I've had many where somebody's chasing me and I'm afraid because they're chasing me. And then I've become lucid in the dream and I've been like, oh, this is a dream. And you know what? The person is still there, but I'm not afraid anymore. So my point is, is again, is, is that you could feel something in your body and freak out. <laughs> or you could be like, well, there's a sensation. It would probably be wise for me to go have that checked out. And maybe I will just wait to freak out until there's something to freak out about. And there's a very, very skillful way that you could go all the way to the grave and not freak out. It's what they're talking about. It's what everybody's been talking about. Plato's been talking about it to, since day one as well, which is this, you know, this is all about dying with grace. <laughs> it's all I can say. And it's the one thing that we have, again, it's the mortality aspect of this. We don't have control over the way that we're going to deal with it. That's what we can have control over. So, all right, everybody, we didn't get to the sutra tonight, but that's okay, because I think it was a good discussion. I hope you all agree. Any last questions, comments, answers, ideas? Robert looks like he has something to say. Oh, um, I uh, was introduced to Buddhism because I had practiced transcendental meditation for many years and my older brother took the uh maharishi siddha's uh, uh you know the levitation and stuff like that and um some i would meditate with a group of them and then i would have to leave the room um when they were about to do the siddhas and so uh, but i can tell you that uh medit meditating in the propinquity of a bunch of siddhas um almost a stendhal syndrome it, i would almost pass out i would lose consciousness there was, but I don't, I don't want to take up too much time, but. Michael, what's up? Hey, uh, <laughs> um, so I, I don't quite know how to frame it because um, it's just kind of more experiential, but um, there seems to be some sort of relative connection between the cities and the vows against the cities, if that makes sense. Almost like an, like there's a way in which those vows what they're doing what they're intended to do you really have to understand that in order to actually penetrate what's going on in the cities you have mm. to understand like on a on a really like um what would be the right word um on a very sort of like second third turning kind of way understand the wisdom of what's going on in the vow does that make sense it does okay it does now I, got, I will mention though, Michael, uh, I hear what you're saying. The vow, which is to say the precept that I mentioned, you know, about not bragging or talking about the, having the Siddhis, 
does seem to be more of a prohibition about livelihood. At least the documentations are the Buddha didn't want monks soliciting their abilities. And so, right. I mean, right, but that's the right. old school. You already mentioned that you're talking more second, third turning in that way. And that's where, yeah. Yeah, there's also this way in which um, if, you, if you think about it in that way, where you would tell someone about a city rather than through a demonstration that actually transmits the, that understanding of it to them, right? Rather than telling them just in language, oh, I have this power that I can't show you, right? Yeah. So since we're at time, let me say yeah, one. No, oh, no, 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 Michael. Sorry to cut you off. One concluding remark, which is a segue to next week. Next week's talk. I had a. I had envisioned rolling this talk into a, a second part, but this went long. In regards to what Michael was just saying. In the Bodhisattva path, which is what I wanted to talk about, actually, was the Siddhis in the Bodhisattva path. We didn't get there tonight. In the Bodhisattva path, what they will talk about is that there are some people that are drawn to the Dharma because they're very intellectual. And so if you tell them about dependent origination and you tell them about like the, just the deep, deep Dharma, that is upayak or that is upaya for them. Total, for intellectuals, Buddhism has all kinds of things to dazzle your mind, right? However, if there's people who are not very intellectual, but are moved by generosity, the Buddha teaches the paramitas of giving and so on and do it that way. What's interesting is, is that in the Bodhisattva path, they talk about as an upaya, in order to get people excited about the Dharma, for some people, you could perform a miracle. And so in the Mahayana Bodhisattva tradition, Michael, what Michael was referring to sort of, is it becomes an upaya to display these. But it's not, you know, to, huh, to brag. It's not, you know, to get money like the Buddha originally prohibited, but it's for teaching the Dharma in that way. But it's just this recognition that some people need to sort of be dazzled first. And what they actually talk about is the Bodhisattva basically levitating and somebody getting so excited that they're like, oh, will you teach me how to levitate? Will you teach me how to levitate? And it's like, oh yeah, sure. All you gotta do is give up your, all your desire <laughs> or you know, all your want, all your craving. And so it's this great upaya in that way. So, but we're gonna talk about that next week. So perfect. Okay. Thanks so much, Michael. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Um, Thank you. Do you have any? Do you have any announcements? Uh, just a quick one about my uh, my introduction to Buddhism course that I call Turning the Dharma Wheel. It's coming up soon. It starts October first. It's a Saturday morning course, uh, nine to ten thirty. It's a kind of a crash course in Buddhism, but also a very interesting look at the way different Buddhist teachings fit together. So it's an introduction, but also kind of a deep dive in the Dharma. And so that's a 10 week course, again, Saturday, starting October 1st. And you can go to lotusunderground.com. That's my website and find out more about it. And I'll, otherwise I'll be here next week. <laughs>